Welcome to this very special event. My name is Jeff Garrett. I have the honor and privilege of being the Dean of the Wharton School. And on behalf of the University of Pennsylvania, I want to welcome everyone to this event. Uh, before I make some introductory remarks, it is the modern world. So I want to remind everybody that uh, turning every device you've got onto silent or vibrate would be much appreciated. I was in a... I was in quite a serious meeting the other day when somebody's George Thorogood and the Destroyer's ringtone, bad to the bone, came out, and it really didn't sound very good. So um, no ringtones would be greatly appreciated. You're all here at relatively short notice because this is a very special event. Our guest of honor today is President Paul Kagame, uh, the president of Rwanda, who's widely acclaimed for his leadership in guiding Rwanda's transformation following the end of the atrocities of the genocide in 1994. Defying expectations about a small landlocked country in sub-Saharan Africa, Rwanda has emerged as one of the fastest growing economies in the world. In fact, in the current World Bank lists with projections for the next several years, Rwanda joins five other economies in Africa in the world's 12 fastest growing economies. Think about that for a second. Half of the fastest growing economies in the world today and into the short term future are in sub Saharan Africa. In fact, since President Kagame uh, was elected to office in 2000, the average annual economic growth rate in Rwanda has been nearly 8%. If you think about the wonders of compound interest, that means that real per capita income in Rwanda has more than trebled in the past 15 years. At least as impressively when it comes to Rwandan growth is the fact that it has been inclusive. I think everyone today is worried about how widely spread the gains from economic growth are. In Rwanda, it looks as if growth has been incredibly widely spread. The headline statistics, again, according to the World Bank, are that Rwanda has moved more than a million people out of poverty since President Kagame took office. Infant mortality rates have been cut by two thirds and Rwanda has achieved nearly universal access to primary and secondary education. For the Wharton School, our relationship with Rwanda runs deep. Uh, I just had the pleasure of witnessing five smiling Rwandan students have their photographs taken with their president, five of our undergraduates. We have wonderful alumni in Africa and in Rwanda, include, including Eric Kaku, who is with us today. Uh, Eric does an enormous amount for the school, but his work has been widely recognized, including his nomination as one of the very select group of young global leaders for the World Economic Forum. Of course, Eric works for us too. Uh, and he has been teaching with my friend and colleague, Catherine Klein, a Wharton class, a global modular class in Rwanda for the past several years. It's incredibly popular, it's oversubscribed, but more than 120 Wharton students have experienced life in Rwanda and have talked with leaders at the very highest level, including, as I understand it, twice having informal discussions with President Kagame. Study abroad is always, at minimum, I think, mind expanding for our students, but I know, based on the interactions I've had, that the experiences of our students in Rwanda have been literally life changing. As I said, our students have had the experience to interact with President Kagame 
uh, in Rwanda. Today, we get the opportunity to interact with him here today. And I was just speaking with the president, um, who isn't going to deliver an address. We're actually going to have a conversation with the president. And I think it's a testament both to his abilities and to the regard with which he holds Catherine Klein that he's willing to have a conversation with her in which it's not all scripted. That'll make the stage conversation very interactive, but as you'll see, we have microphones in the room for all of you to interact with the president, and we will segue from the on-stage conversation to one with all of you quite quickly. Um, let me welcome them both to the stage by saying one thing about, two things about Catherine Klein. The first thing about Catherine uh, is that she is the Vice Dean of the Wharton Social Impact Initiative. The second thing to say about Catherine is that while she's passionate about many things having to do with the social impact agenda of the school and the university, her passion is no greater than when it comes to Rwanda. She's led all of the Wharton Global Modular classes in Rwanda. She's passionate about the country. She's, she's supportive of all that it has achieved and all that it may achieve in the future. And I know that that will be the subject of her conversation with President Kagame. So please join me in welcoming both Catherine Klein and President Paul Kagame of Rwanda to the stage now. President Kagame, it is wonderful to have you here. Thank you for the honor of coming to Wharton and to Penn. And thank you to uh, everyone in the audience. I have to say, we, weren't, we, we really didn't know what size audience we would have. And we thought, we better prepare for a, a smaller audience. And we realized very rapidly we were wrong. And uh, the, this audience is testament to how eager everyone is to learn from you, to learn more about the story of Rwanda, and to talk about the future of Rwanda. So thank, thank you, you so much for being with us. Thank you very much. Um, so let me get started. Um, I, I'd like to start with um, April 2014, uh, the speech that you gave on the occasion of the uh, 20th commemoration of the genocide. <laughs> Um, you were in uh, Amahora Stadium, a very serious, emotional, momentous time 20 years after the genocide. And um, you gave a little bit of a, of a history lesson and a framing of, of Rwanda at the time. And you said, um, at the end of the genocide, quote, everything was a priority and our people were completely broken. And you went on to describe Four, three fundamental choices that Rwandans made in rebuilding the country. And, and I'd like you to, to help us understand those, those choices. You said, one, we chose to stay together. Two, we chose to be accountable to ourselves. Three, we chose to think big. So particularly for those in the audience who may not know so much about Rwanda, could you tell us what those choices mean, what they meant, and, and how you came to them. Thank you. First of all, I'm grateful for the invitation to come and address uh, this gathering in this great institution. I'm happy to be here. And thank you for the many visits you have paid uh, our country and many people in the audience. Now, to the question. Uh, the three points uh, I raised in my speech at that time uh, stemmed from, indeed, what we understand to be our history and the complexity of, of, of that history. And I started with uh, being together. Uh, it talks about unity. It was relating to the very fact of how the country uh, historically has, has been divided, and indeed the 
divisive politics bringing the country to witness the tragedy we had in 1994. So it, 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 it therefore was trying to bring to the attention of everybody the importance of being together as a nation. Even if there will be diversity in our society, people will be different, but at the end of the day, we have to work toward a common cause for the interest of the whole country. And so I was appealing to people to say, we are different, we may think differently, and, but at the end of the day, we have to bring our energies together mm -hmm. to, for the common good of the country instead of breaking it apart as we have already experienced. So we've learned lessons from that. It, it isn't just a story we are told, it's also a life we have lived. Second is the importance of accountability, meaning for all we aspire to achieve in our lives as a nation, and, and therefore learning from our history as well, how can we not say, you know, in our sense of freedom, people doing things differently and acting differently and having different views. At the end of the day, you won't achieve this unity or you won't achieve progress unless in the exercise of your freedoms, you are able to think about the interest of the other and not just thinking about yourself. Therefore, that's how it comes to a point where every one of us has to be responsible and we have to account to each other as well as we hold ourselves accountable so that even in, with the best intentions people may have doing certain things differently, you don't end up hurting somebody else. And this again originates from our own history where division was the order of the day and people have been told to hate each other to the point that people started seeing the other as uh, different, and not only different, they should get rid of them. Right. So therefore, accountability was uh, important and was lacking at the time. So that's why I was talking about accountability, so that we, we really bring a sense of responsibility in everyone, the leaders and the citizens. And of course, number three, thinking big, uh, was to relate to saying, first of all, even with all the problems we have faced in the tragedy we had uh, 21 years ago, seeing how we have come out of that and where we are today, we also give a sense that nothing is impossible. If people set their minds to doing something they want to do and that is good for them, uh, they will be able to achieve it. Uh, and and there is nothing impossible to achieve. So if Rwanda can be where it is now with that history, with all kinds of challenges, uh, a small economy in the middle of Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa, right there in the middle, and landlocked, and you know, almost short of everything, including the fact that we, we are now building from a very low base in which we were put by uh, the genocide in 1994 and lost one million people, other millions displaced, impoverished, and so on. So, you, you know, if you think about it like this, it is easy for somebody to, to despair and say, well, we can't get out of this. This is impossible to change. So, but if you start from the point that everything is possible and, and, and think beyond these problems and, and really want to achieve something big, you will be there. And that's the experience we have had in the last 21 years. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to ask you about reconciliation. Um, so in, in many countries in the world, 
clearly, uh, ethnic, racial, and religious differences are a source of ongoing discrimination, tension, uh, violence, persecution. And, and I think we often look at those differences and think, this can never change. This will be here. We, we will be we and them forever. And maybe even we will be we and them, and maybe you can bury it, but it will reemerge. This is the human condition. Uh, in Rwanda, um, we see, astonishingly, for foreigners who visited, visited, we see genocide heirs and survivors and their families living and working side by side uh, in peace. And a, and a common refrain in Rwanda is, you know, when asked about identity, I am Rwandan. We are all Rwandan. So I'd like you to talk with us about the extent of reconciliation in, in Rwanda, if today. And if, Rwa if reconciliation is a process or a multi-layered phenomenon, where is Rwanda today? What is the stage of, or the depth of reconciliation in Rwanda as you understand it and perceive it? How, how deep is this phenomenon? Uh, where are we uh, in the country? And then what are the implications for how you govern? Well, that's a very uh, deep and, and complex question, but uh, uh, anyway, as the situation is, um, if, um, let me say it this way. In, in 2004, when we were commemorating, uh, you know, remembering genocide, in April 7th. There were two young people who survived. One of them had been picked from um, uh, the mass grave. They had, you know, there was a mass grave of 5,000 people. You know, caterpillars had come and just put bodies there and covered them with soil. And so. Our troops arrived just moments after it had happened and picked people from that mass grave who were still breathing. And one young person who was there, you know, showing, you know, scars of that situation and so on. So I, I, after giving testimony and the pain and everything they experienced, so I, I directly asked him, I said, uh, how, how, do you, how do you manage? How do you really... And especially this was at a time when people had been involved in the genocide at different levels and had been in prison for some time were released. This was 2004, you said? 2004, that was 10 years after. Right. And uh, I said, how, how do you manage? Especially when they had been talking about seeing people whom they think are responsible for the deaths of their families and so on, released from prison, as uh, which the government had done at the time, and a very complicated process. And this uh, young person told me, says, you know, I, I'm sitting there at home and watching people pass, you know, and, and some of those are those that have just been released from uh, prison by government and as a gesture and as a way of trying to resolve these differences and reconciliation and so on. A complex, a complicated mix of reconciliation and justice. And he says, uh, I just managed to live on and survive because the young man looked at me and says, President and you other leaders, we, we trust you, we have faith in you, and uh, you tell us to do a number of things to try and understand this and that you are doing all this in the best interest of all of us. So we have faith with you, and that's how we survive. This is what the young man told me. So that tells the whole story. It's, we are confronted with the situation here. You have perpetrators, you have victims in hundreds of thousands, not just a few cases you have to deal with. 
You do one thing, the other side thinks you're not doing enough, or you're not even being fair. You do another thing, the other side say, thinks you're not being fair, you're not doing enough. And so you are somewhere right in the middle, caught up in the middle, but you have to do something. You have, you have, you have to attempt, you have to try and do something. So this is what we've been trying to do. So we, we, we tell people, we say, it's in your hands. There isn't going to be a solution that is going to come from elsewhere that we shall deliver to you. It's only going to come from within. And it, it's not going to be easy, but it's the only thing we have to do because if we don't do it, the situation we face ahead will be even more complicated. Uh, to the point that we have lost one million and have a lot of suffering still going on, that will be doubled or tripled if we will, if we don't uh, really uh, do the best we can to do that. So, but telling them that is not enough. You, you therefore have to design a number of things and ways to make sure that. For example, to some extent, justice is seen to be done. Uh, the other is the daily lives that have to be lived by providing education, health, you know, food security, uh, a sense of security that, uh, the other sense of security that uh, those who are there, someone will not just come and take their lives again the way it happened. But we have to design, and we found a way to say, but you are part of this. Ensuring your security isn't going to be achieved by somebody else doing it for you, but you participating in ensuring that you give somebody security as well as somebody else is expected to give you security. Mm -hmm. And then, as, as I said, dealing with these social economic issues that uh, at the end of the day, somebody needs food, somebody needs education for their children, they need health, they need, uh, this must be there. Otherwise, the, everything else will be, you know, people won't understand what right. we are trying to do. So really, this is the, the complex uh, nature of the processes we have had to go through. It, it takes time. So, but I'm saying, back to the very question you raised, I think we have turned the corner. Mm. We have built a foundation, a very firm foundation, but we have to build on that. Mm -hmm. So we are now in the phase of building on the foundation. I think the foundation is there. People understand the reason to get along, to give and take, you know, to understand that nothing will be rosy and people will not be satisfied, all of them won't, but there will be a balance by which we, we, we can move forward and, and then get the big things that must be done. Great, thank you. Um, so building on that foundation, let me uh, ask some questions about some of the ways you have and continue to build on that foundation. Uh, certainly a, a, another striking achievement uh, for us, who are, uh, a striking achievement of Rwanda's, and particularly striking for those of us who come from abroad to visit Rwanda, is the, the extent of gender equality uh, in Rwanda. Uh, perhaps specifically in the parliament. So no country in the world has a larger percentage of women in the, its parliament than Rwanda does, uh, substantially over 50%. Uh, how has Rwanda achieved the gender equality it, it has? Why has it been important to do so? And what lessons can um, the rest of the world, can we as business leaders, as leaders in governments around the world, uh, learn from Rwanda's successes in this regard? Uh, there are maybe a number of things to learn from here, which we have learned ourselves by trying 
things. In fact, what has helped us in many ways, we, we, we are not afraid of trying things that uh, may work for us, even for, in many cases, being in situations where there is nothing else we can do other than trying. Uh, so we we'll try that. But and it stems from the whole history again, from uh, at least as far as I'm concerned, the liberation days, uh, trying to change the situation in, in our own country. Some of us, I grew up as a young, from uh, the time I was between three and four years old, I was a refugee. I grew, up, I grew up in a refugee camp for close to 25 years uh, in a neighboring country, Uganda. And I, I, I lost my father when I was uh, 14. It's my mother who looked, and we had six children, um, the last born of the six children. And it's the, our mother who looked after us all the way at the time we grew up. Now, what sense does it make that, and, and I'm sure this is not just me, I'm sure there are many cases like that, many other cases. This is just my example. What sense does it make in a society to discriminate against your mother, your daughter, your sister, your aunt. It doesn't make sense. Uh, at the same time, in Rwanda today, 52% of our population are women. Can you imagine getting 52% of the population out of the economy? And, and, and you think you are doing something sensible? I don't think so. So there are issues of uh, rights here as well. It's really an issue of even human rights. You see. So we understood it from the beginning that women as well as uh, others have to be involved in all, at all levels and in all activities meant for the development of our country. So that's how we designed our, you know, policies and right from the beginning that has been the approach. Built into the Constitution as well. And, and even put it in the Constitution. We have to make sure that we don't take it like, you know, leave it to anybody to, to say, well, I, to be left with a choice to do it or not to do it. Hmm. Mm -hmm. we, we thought it was important that we make it an obligation. And that's how we put it in the Constitution to make sure that women are given their rightful place in our society. In fact, there are a number of things we did, I, I probably not to go into all of these, but for example, even uh, we had very old laws uh, that discriminated actually against women to the extent that women could not, for example, inherit property. So we have changed that law. We now our women can inherit property as, as men do and others. So th this was trying to really bring the kind of sense into the balancing that we had to do. So that's how, and we encouraged it, and now we educated our women, we have invested in making sure that the health issues are, are given a priority, as well as when we have educated women and when we, they, they are healthy and they are playing other roles anyway as usual, we have encouraged them to participate at all levels in decision-making processes so that they don't sit back and somebody else makes a decision that affects all of us but, and specifically affects women when they have not had a say. That's how it came to, that we encouraged it, put it in a constitution, then encouraged them to participate and they ended up now we have 64% representation of women in parliament. We have about 42% uh, in the judiciary. Mm. 
we have uh, women mayors, we have uh, you know, women ministers, the constitution tells uh, us that we can't have less than 30% representation of women in the cabinet, for example, of ministers, and so on and so forth. So we are seeing it happening, and the benefits are real. The, the, when women have participated in, in decision making, when they are in the business, when they are doing different things, well, first of all, that is to scale that uh, it should be, and uh, they have different approaches they bring on, in, in the processes uh, that uh, we were missing if we didn't have. Uh, uh, women uh, uh, participating. So I think it's beneficial as we have seen all around. And maybe we, we, we may actually attribute a, a constant progress uh, in the social and economic transformation of our country to this uh, broad and deep involvement of women in our affairs. Thank you. Um, Jeff Garrett uh, referred to Rwanda's economic progress, and uh, I have another, I have yet another big question for you, and I know that uh, you, know, you, you can't give the answers the full depth you might like, um, but I'd like to refer to uh, your economic development strategy, the Economic Development and Poverty Eradication Strategy 2, EDPRS 2. Um, and this, this document, this strategy, outlines ambitious goals for the next several years. Uh, the overarching goal is uh, accelerating progress to middle income status and better quality of life for all Rwandans through sustained GDP growth of 11.5% and accelerated reduction of poverty to less than 30% of the population. I will say for those who have not experienced Rwanda, the, the specificity, the, the ambition of the goals and the specificity of the goals and the, the use of metrics is, is very much something we see over and over again in Rwanda. And, um, and if I can highlight for a quick moment the, uh, the formula that is presented at the beginning of this document for, for those of us who are professors and theorists, it's a beautifully simple and incredibly uh, challenging formula and that is, that is presented, and it says, rapid economic growth plus reduction of poverty to under 30% equals better quality of life for all Rwandans. So I would like for you to at least begin to discuss with us your, how, how you envision Rwanda achieving these goals, continuing in rapid economic growth and, and reduction of poverty and specifically reduction of poverty, you know, as, as you know, I, members of the audience may not know, of course, um, I believe the numbers are something like 70% of the population are still uh, employed in subsistence and, and live from their subsistence farming. So small plots of land, a real challenge as you think about growing the economy of moving these people off of their, their, their plots of land. Mm -hmm. So thinking big as Rwanda does, how will you achieve this goal over the coming decade? We, 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 we start by transforming what we have as we do other things and maybe achieve what we didn't have. For example, we start with agriculture, <clears throat> which employs the majority of Rwandans. It has largely been subsistence agriculture. So we are now modernizing that agriculture, making it more productive, so that the very large population involved in that gain more from it than has been the case before. Uh, and that is already happening. We've seen that. In fact, uh, in the comment area mentioned, when we lifted uh, one million people out of poverty, it was just between the year 2006 to 2011. And in fact, these gains came from the improvements we have seen in agriculture. Uh, better seed varieties, uh, uh, 
uh, available inputs, uh, better methods, technology, uh, and therefore more productivity, as we have seen, and, and uh, finding markets for the, what is being produced, both domestically and across borders. So this is, this is one part. So it is what we have, can we realize the full potential? We looked at coffee, which is produced by uh, Rwanda, one of the, the best coffees you have in the world, if not the best, as we know it across the world. Make it more productive, beneficial to citizens, who had earlier on given up actually on growing coffee because there wasn't much coming from it. Now they're involved in growing coffee and they add value, they wash the coffee they produced before, we, we export it, we are now beginning to roast our coffee, and so on. So farmers are benefiting from that. The tea, the same thing, and, and so on. Anything that has been involving the biggest part of our, of our population, we focused on it. Then beyond that, we started focusing on other areas where, again, we started from a very low base, but we know we have so we built uh, and, and, and leveraged our, the institutions we have created, the good governance thereof, and, and so started investing, say, in uh, financial services, you know, ICT, high-end tourism, uh, and so on and so forth. These, these are things that have moved very fast uh, and grown very fast and, and bring in a lot of uh, benefits to the people and uh, as well as to the country. So this is how we are managing it. And we are finding that actually things are moving faster than we even had expected. Uh, but the, 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 and fight, creating an environment that is conducive to doing business, uh, we had to attend to that. Uh, safety and security for people and for investments they make in the country. All of these things have added up uh, and helped us accelerate uh, achieving the economic growth but not just impressive economic growth, but economic growth that is contributing to development and that is inclusive because we have made sure that Rwandans are involved in all of these activities. Thank you. Uh, let, me, let me ask, I think, one more question before I'll, uh, we'll take a few questions from the audience. Um, so as, as you know well, um, many, many foreign journalists and observers are critical of limits on free speech in Rwanda. And laws in Rwanda prohibit, prohibit divisionism. Uh, divisionism is spreading ideas likely to incite conflict based on ethnic, regional, racial, religious, language, or other divisive characteristics. And there are also laws in Rwanda that, that prohibit defamation of the head of state or other public officials. And so I'd, I'd, I'd like you to not, um, to help us understand how you think about the, the benefits and drawbacks of free speech and dissent for Rwanda. Um, you know, what are the, the benefits and drawbacks of free speech and dissent uh, in the country as a whole, for example, in the press and social media? Um, and if we have time, I, I'm mindful of the time, also in your own cabinet. Well, I, I think, there are a lot of contradictions in what has been said in this area about Rwanda mm. uh, and the disregard of the real facts on the ground. Now, let, let me say, say, say this. Uh, I use Twitter. We know. <laughs> and, we follow you. Uh, for example, somebody said something about me. Yes. And I answered back by clarifying what it was. So we went back and forth. And actually, this person happened to be a journalist in the UK. Mm. Of course, as we continued arguing, this very journalist who wants uh, freedom of speech to be exercised 
started complaining about uh, how I'm pushing back. So, and I asked this journalist, I said, look, you, you have a control. You, you, you want people to express themselves. And that's how you manage to talk, say things about me, the way you did. But at the same time, in this uh, freedom to, of free speech, you don't want me to tell you my views of what I think myself. Hmm. So is, is free speech going to be for you and not for me? Because this, and, and this has been almost a constant throughout. So what is it that prevents me, a user of social media, giving my views? Even as president, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I have views. I, I'm not dumb, I'm just... Uh... <laughs> so, but as long as you can push back and say what you want to say, I should be able to say what I want to yes, say. Yes. <laughs> Absolutely. Now, same thing. It happens even within our country. I'm actually exchanging, debating, discussing with the people on the social media. So how this comes that we don't allow freedom of speech in Rwanda doesn't show in this that happens every day. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Uh, so, now, there's another thing. Um, <clears throat> there have been a lot of surveys, uh, international surveys, done by independent institutions. Gallup poll and all kinds of things. If you, uh, you look at uh, in the reports that have come up in the last three, three five years, you see, the, it's something interesting. They came and carried out surveys across thousands of people in Rwanda on their own. We didn't even know about it. In the report, they talk, the, the people saying that they are free to elect their leaders, to say whatever they want to say, it was 86%, right? Now, but what is interesting and revealing of the point I'm talking about is, in that report, if you read it carefully, there is where they say somebody, you can see the writer is, intends to bias the reader. He says, although Rwanda uh, is uh, knows authoritarian, you know, this starts by telling people right. it's, uh, you know, the leadership is authoritarian. Right. And then it goes ahead to say, People who said they are free to express themselves to the are 85, 86%. But you can see, he starts by saying, you know, it's authoritarian. Sure. Right. So he wants people, first of all, to read that the following findings they made themselves should, not, should be disregarded. What should be taken is what he has stated, that mm -hmm. this is an authoritarian situation. So I, 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 I think Rwanda has, has two sides to it. There is what Rwanda is and has been and wants to be. Yes. There is another Rwanda in the eyes of other people who want it to be or expect it to be something else, and they make that a fact. Hmm. That, that's the situation we have to deal with. So your, so your argument is that, in fact, there is substantial free speech and dissent yes, there is. and much of it playing out in social I'm, media. I'm sure you, you have uh, been there. By the way, even on radios, we have uh, so many FM radios free, and, and you, you need to listen to what they are saying in French, in English, in uh, Kenya, Rwanda, talking about the president the way they want. We haven't shut these uh, radios. They are still operating. Nobody has been punished for it. So it, it, it doesn't really add up to some of these things being said. So.